Well, it's another day. Time to throw you guys another slideshow. I just <clears throat> I love going through my old pictures and uh, talking about why it was I took them. And uh, I'm going to start this one here out. This is this beautiful old pickup truck. One of those that somebody had restored. I, you know, the little uh, church that I go to has got like 90 or 100 people usually. And the pastor said one time, we're going to have a car show next Saturday. And I was like, that's a bunch of hooey. You know, who in the world is going to uh, come here to a car show, you know, that we're having at our little church or whatever. I don't know where the next Saturday, there was cars all over the place. They had come from three states and all. I was blown away how many cars there were and how beautiful they were. The older vehicles and all. Uh, I think the newest one there was like a 91 model. Uh, it was one of these, uh, you know, hot rod uh, Mercury Marauders. <clears throat> but this old pickup here interested me because whoever it was that did this restoration on this old pickup had done everything they could to make this thing look like it had just rolled off the showroom floor. It was absolutely gorgeous. You know, of course, there was other trucks in the background and all that kind of stuff and tractors and <clears throat> whatnot down there. But the long and the short of it was, it was really a surprise to me. How, and I got some really good pictures of the engines and stuff like that, you know, that I could use whenever I was talking to them. Uh, students they used to teach about how things used to be and <clears throat> all that but that was the first thing I wanted to say this one right here is uh, some students uh, there was this guy and uh, <clears throat> in the PowerPoint before I kind of mentioned this but I found this picture here this uh, 88 model uh, Honda um, CRX I guess it was you know I get those letters messed up sometimes but anyway this guy uh, had a really good engine in this car. I don't know if he had it rebuilt or whatever. Uh, but the long and short of it was he had crashed the car. And so he bought another car that was the same year model, but it was a it wasn't the hot rod he when it was this one here was the hot rod that had the multi point fuel injection and that kind of thing in it, the one point six liter engine <clears throat> Honda. And he had a uh, uh, blue one that he bought. It was you know just a plain old car. And so he wanted to pull the engine, uh, and the, the blue one was, the body was in good shape, he said it had a bad engine in it, and it pulled, pulled in there. <clears throat> and so I said, well, this is a perfect opportunity for us to, you know, troubleshoot this engine that's in this car, because we're going to pull it out anyway, you know. <clears throat> and if we pull it out and tear it down, we'll be able to see what, you know, what went bad, what took place, and all that kind of thing. And I kind of got um, <clears throat> bowled over by this one right here, because... It sounded normal spinning over. Now it wouldn't start the, the one in the car that he bought to replace. You know, we were going to pull the engine out of this yellow one and put in the blue one. And um, uh, there was a couple of issues we had to deal with. We'll talk about that in a minute. But <clears throat> when I spun it over, it sounded fairly normal spinning over. And I said, well, let's go ahead and do a compression test and see what we get there. So number four cylinder had no compression whatsoever. I said, all right, now we're going to do a cylinder leakage test. We're going to put it so that the uh, valves are closed on this uh, number four cylinder. You know, you got to work the engine through to where the valves are closed, and you know they're closed. And, <clears throat> and we did a cylinder leakage test. We had no cylinder leakage at all on number four, but we also had no compression. And... I didn't expect that. I was kind of scratching my head about it, you know. And you know, you you run through some scenarios in your mind <laughs> trying to figure out why the hell this happened. <clears throat> but when we were pulling the motor out of the car, and we noticed there was a hole knocked in the side of the block, and this thing had thrown a rod so violently that it had busted that the bottom of the rod off, uh, while the piston, you know, the crankshaft had spun around. And popped the bottom off of the rod and busted a hole in the block and threw it out on the highway somewhere. And the piston was in the bottom of its hole and it was just sitting there. And it was broke off so perfectly that it wasn't even hardly touching the crank when it would spin over. That's why it wasn't locked up. But the piston rings were holding the air and the valves were holding the air really good. But it didn't have any compression because the piston wasn't moving. It didn't have any cylinder leakage because the valves, the piston rings were good and the piston was just staying in the bottom, you know. Anyway, an interesting thing. But we had another issue with this. <clears throat> and I told my students, I said, this, this yellow one has got multi-point fuel injection. It's 1.6. This blue one is 1.5, and it's got throttle body injection. And I gave my students a brain teaser. I said, how are you going to take care of that? You know, you're going to take this 
you got to take the motor out of this yellow one, and this motor's got multi-point fuel injection on it, and put it in that blue one. So what, what are you going to do about that? And they said, I, I got to pull the wire harnesses and the engine controller and all, and, and redo all of that. Oh, this is going to be horrible. And I says, no, that's not what you do. And I explained to him the concept of a long block. I said, what you're going to do is you're going to take the manifolds off, lay them back out of the way on both engines, <clears throat> and you're going to lift the engine out of this one as a long block, and you're going to drop it in that blue one as a long block, and then you're going to put the, the same fuel injection system that came on the blue one buckled up to this 1.6 liter engine, which doesn't hurt a thing, only you've got throttle body injection on a 1.6 where you had multi-point on a 1. Point, I mean, uh, yeah, on the 1.6 in the other car. <coughs> anyway, we got uh, that one all knocked out and everything. And uh, I think the bill on that was $400, you know, just because of all the stuff we had to do to make it work and all. But long and short of it was, that was a very interesting thing. I took the speedometer out of this 88 model car and I put it in there in the classroom and I would use it. I would jumper the gauges to make them, you know, little magnetic gauges. But somebody asked me one day, why does the 55 on this speedometer have a, a red uh, square around it? Because they had no concept of the 55 mile an hour speed limit we had to put up with. And you know, 55 mile an hour speed limit came after the gas crunch of the early 70s when Congress wanted to try to save gas and somebody had convinced them that you know, you get 40% more gas mileage going 55 on a given vehicle than you do going 65. So if you drop it to 55, you're going to save gas, which they thought was something that needed to be done. Also, a lot of people didn't know it, but this right turn on red after full stop at traffic signals was a part of that same gas saving strategy. And it's still there. The 55 mile an hour speed limit eventually went away because these senators and congressmen got tired of cre creeping along an interstate when you could be driving faster, you know. Anyway, let's move on. <clears throat> I have seen in my career a few times where the lock cylinder, and these lock cylinder here was on a Ford Focus, an early 2000s Ford Focus, and you know how legendarily horrible those things were if you ever ran into one. The lock cylinder just comes apart on the inside and suddenly it feels like you've got somebody else's key because now your lock cylinder won't turn and you can't start the car. Um, <clears throat> the first time I saw that was on a Thunderbird that when I was working at Ford Place. And I'm sure it's happened before that. It was the first time I ran into it. And so what I had to do was go out there and get a, uh, you know, drill uh, and drill into that thing. And then when you when you get it drilled down there to where the tumblers and everything are kind of in the chunks of stuff that's falling out of there that's keeping you from turning it, you shove a screwdriver in there and you turn it to the start position and then you pull that lock cylinder out you pop another one in there and you know, blow all the trash out and everything. <clears throat> and then you've got another lock cylinder and the key works and all that. Now sometimes they're a little harder to drill out than others because on some of the Fords they have these super, super hard uh, little dowels on either side of where the key goes in. And you can start trying to drill down in there and when that drill hits those little hard pieces of dowel, it stops drilling. It doesn't go any farther so you got to, you know, pry around and get those things out of there before you can uh, pound your screwdriver down in there. Now one time uh, there was a, uh, you know, that big dealership where I worked. I drew this in, drew this ticket on this bucket truck. It was a, they said it was a white bucket truck that belonged to a local power company. And they said the, uh, <clears throat> it wouldn't start and they thought something was going on with the key. And I said, well, I've seen these lock cylinders do this before. You know, I'd seen it on that Thunderbird and some other vehicles. And they always gave it to me to drill the darn thing out, you know. Kind of makes a mess, but you can vacuum it up, and it's like you were never there when you're done if you do it right. <clears throat> but you get a 3 8 drill bit and go down into that center of that lock cylinder. Long short of it was, I would take, if I had one that was starting to go bad but hadn't quite gone bad yet, back when they used to have these metal wings on the key, you know, and I would take that thing and stick the original key in it, and then I would grab my channel locks, which I showed you a picture of last week, and I would turn that thing to the start position and pull the lock cylinder out, which you have to turn it to the lock position and push that little button to get the lock cylinder out. <clears throat> and so what happened was I went ahead and uh, 
went out to that bucket truck, I climbed up in there, I stuck the key in there, and I said, oh yeah, yeah, this is definitely a lock cylinder problem. And so I grabbed that thing and I heard it crunching and all when I turned it over. And I, I started the truck and I actually pulled it into the shop and was replacing the lock cylinder in it when our maintenance man walked up and he says, what are you doing to our bucket truck? <clears throat> and I said, what do you mean our bucket truck? Because I didn't even know we had a bucket truck. He says, oh yeah, we just bought this yesterday. It was a white bucket truck, just like the one I thought I was supposed to be working on. Of course, doofy me if I'd have paid attention. You know, sometimes that little locator they hang on the mirror falls off and slides down there somewhere or something. Or, or sometimes we just don't pay attention to it because we're looking and we think we know the truck we're working on. Anyway, <coughs> I put a lock cylinder in our bucket truck to fix the one I had screwed up using the other bucket truck's key with our bucket truck messing that one up. Anyway, we, I replaced that and I went and got the other bucket truck I was supposed to be working on and I took care of that problem or whatever it was. I don't even remember what the problem was with the other one, but it wasn't the... It might have been the ignition switch coming apart like some of those trucks did. <clears throat> but it wasn't the lock cylinder. But see, that work order confused me because they said it thought they were going to have something to do with the key or the switch. A lot of people will call the part where you stick the key in the ignition switch when actually it's somewhere else. And it's just mechanically actuated by this lock cylinder on the column. Of course, nowadays a lot of cars have got push button start. <clears throat> but another time this happened was on a, uh, when I was over at the college, it happened on a Jeep Cherokee. I had to drill one out on one of those and replace that lock cylinder. And there was a Chevrolet 16-passenger uh, van that our air conditioning instructor called me from way over in uh, the neighboring town. And he said he had taken some of his students on a field trip. And they stopped to get gas. And when they got back in it, it was like the key didn't fit the vehicle anymore. Had to have that one towed in on a rollback. Had to drill that one out. There was a Saturn that came in with the same problem. The key just suddenly wouldn't fit anymore. And on that Saturn, <clears throat> you had to replace the lock cylinder with one that you bought from the dealer. But the dealer, which was in the town about 75, 80 miles up the road, would not sell me a lock cylinder. They said the person that owns the car has got to bring the title to the car and their driver's license and maybe even a birth certificate or something, I don't know what it was, to prove they were the owners of the car. And they would sell them a lock cylinder for $125 if the people that were coming to buy the lock cylinder could produce that, in, that uh, documentation. And so, as it turned out, they brought a lock cylinder back and I replaced that one. Anyway, this is something, it's a dirty deal for whoever experiences it because you're starting the vehicle every day and there's no problem and all of a sudden it's like the key doesn't fit. You know, and those Ford Focuses, like I say, I actually uh, put something in Motor Age one time about the Ford Focus and how you're supposed to draw an X and drill it out and get that little piece out of there and uh, turn it and change it out and all that kind of thing. The lock cylinder in my pickup truck and in my Explorer looks exactly like that one but they've never given it any problem. Of course, since I'm talking about it right now on this video, they'll probably do that to me the next time I go start one of them. But anyway, who knows? So, <clears throat> this is my friend David and me. Now, he was the service rider. Uh, he had actually been an insurance salesman for a long time. He came to work as a service rider when he moved back to his hometown, which is where the dealership was where I work. And we got to be pretty good friends. We'd go to work every day. He's the one I told a story a while back that... Uh, he tried to act like he was going to leave me that night, and I went around behind a tree so he couldn't see me when he came back, and then he drove off in the ditch. <laughs> that's, an, that's an old story that I told, but this is the guy I was talking about. <clears throat> there was another service rider that worked with him that I don't have a picture of, and his name was Tony, and I think he died when he was 50 years old, but he was younger than me, and he was so funny. And uh, one day I went out there, and I says, uh, he says, this guy took his new Bronco over to the uh, tire store and got the front end aligned on it and he called me wanting to know if we would pay for the front end alignment since it was still under warranty and I said well what did you tell him did you tell him no he says not only that but if he ever comes to this dealership again I will have him arrested but anyway I thought that was a funny he was always saying funny stuff like that and, I, and he was a lot of fun to be around and everything but 
anyway, <clears throat> this right here, I used to tell my students, when you pull a brake drum off and it looks like that, the one thing you don't know is if it's leaking axle grease or if you have had a seeping wheel cylinder for a long time. And the quickest way you can tell whether that is axle grease coming out of the axle or brake fluid is to just tap it and taste it. Because you can taste it if it's brake fluid and if it's axle grease you can tell that's what it is too. Uh, of course, you know, my students that, you know, were a little bit squeamish with, you know, go, ooh, gross and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of times, you know, when you see something dripping out from under the car and you wonder if it's coming from the air conditioner evaporator or if it's some real, <clears throat> you know, barely colored water with antifreeze in it, you can tap that and just touch it to the tip of your tongue. If it's sweet, you know it's antifreeze. If it's just clear water, you know that too. You're going to spit it out anyway. You're not gonna, it's not like you're putting a spoonful of that stuff in your mouth and swallowing it. But, um... Anyway, I've got my own way of doing stuff, you know, if, you, if you're not comfortable tasting of it, just do your own thing, you know. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I'm not giving anybody any advice here, I'm just telling you how I used to do it. And I, you know, I taught my students to do it, most of them weren't going to do it if they didn't want to, but I didn't penalize them if they didn't. But that's the quickest way you can find out what's going on. If you rebuild these brakes and you put a new wheel cylinder on it and it turns out it's axle grease, you're going to be doing the job over. So it's important to find out going in what it is. <clears throat> All right, this right here was uh, after I had been measuring the center electrode on spark plugs for years with a meter, and I would measure them and compare them. Usually, you get five to seven thousand ohms or something like that. And I like for them to be all alike. If you get one that's wide open or one that's only got two hundred ohms, you know, like for example, on these cop coil forge, if I went found one that was skipping, I didn't just throw a cop coil in it. I'd pull a plug out, and I would measure the resistance to the center electrode. <clears throat> that guy. In it, champion spark plug engineer and I said something about it in a motor age magazine and you know incidentally after I started doing that I was just t doing it for my own purposes you ever do something that you've never seen in a book just because you want to see what kind of results you'll get I mean you know you experiment that's the kind of stuff that I do so you got to scratch pretty good on the uh, on the uh, firing end of that spark plug and get make sure that you're getting a good contact with the metal and all that. And usually I say you get five to seven thousand ohms and it's really close from one spark plug to the other. <clears throat> if I pull the plugs and I've got one that was misfiring like on number three or whatever and then I measure it and that one's only got 200 ohms or if it's a dead short or if it's got no resistance at all then I'll say well that was going to be, even if the other plugs are new then I put a plug in there with that coil pack. Just, you know, just gather all the data you can and sort it out. This ride I ran into though, when I went to an engine performance class after I'd already been doing it I went to an engine performance class in Tallahassee uh, Florida at the Ford Training Center uh, of course it was at a junior college but it was a training center that they had rented from the, I think they do all the training in Atlanta now but the long and short of it was they showed on that training program measuring the resistance of that spark plug and they said it shouldn't be over 8,000 ohms the champion guy didn't like that and he says, you're never supposed to do that. You're just always supposed to use a scope to check spark plugs. I don't disagree with using a scope, but I told the guy, I says, well, Ford says to do it. You know, whether you like it or not, I don't know. And the next champion, set of champion spark plugs I got, I took and I measured those things, every single one of them brand new out of the box. You know, and I'm not here to, to campaign against champion spark plugs. Don't get me wrong. But what I found on that set of champion spark plugs that I bought after that champion spark plug guy was railing on me, <coughs> I found out that they ranged in re resistance from 2,000 to 17,000 ohms, and they were all over the place between those two readings. It's interesting to me that Motorcraft, Autolat, Delco, these other spark plugs, Nip and Gen, so they all, if you've got four spark plugs that come out of the same box, they're measuring almost exactly the same thing between here and here with your meter. Take that for what it's worth. You know, uh, cars are going to have spark plugs as long as there's any kind of an S, uh, internal combustion engine. Some of these hybrid in, hybrid vehicles have an, with internal combustion engines have got indexed spark plugs so that you're supposed to uh, point the fire and, uh, you know, the part of the spark plug that's, you know, is firing toward the valve. And, and their spark plugs are marked A, B, C, and D or something like that. I can't remember. That's a on uh, our uh, whatever it was, might have been a Honda Insider, a Prius, I don't even remember. 
but <clears throat> anyway, I learned about that a long time ago. And there's, there's a lot of stuff I hadn't learned about yet, you know. Quaker State Oil was everybody's favorite in this part of the country for a very long time. They would say, and this is a can of oil I have out there in the garage that I saved, had never been opened. But this red top, you know, they say Quaker State Red Top, that's what they tell me. When I worked at the gas station and all the oil cans were round, there was no oil that came in plastic bottles in those days. Some of the oil cans were uh, sort of a foiled paper, but the Quaker State cans were steel, uh, rolled steel cans, and they'd have the crimp at the bottom of the top like an old Coca-Cola can. You know, of course, we had this spout we had to shove down in there and cut up, cut into the can and all that to pour the oil in the car. Anyway, people used to claim in this part of the country that Quaker State oil would sludge up your engine. Now, if you change the oil, regularly, and you always let the engine warm up without shutting it off cold, you're not going to have a sludge problem unless there's something wrong with your PCV system. Quaker State took a bad rap on that for a long time. But the shop foreman that worked at the dealership over there where I was, <coughs> I guess it was back in the 70s, he had been raised to think that Quaker State oil would sludge up your engine. He made mention of that to some customer who made mention of it to Quaker State and Quaker State found out who he was and what he had said and sent him a letter and called him on the phone and said don't you ever say that again because that's just factually not true and sort of scared him a little bit because he was afraid he was going to have to pay some kind of a fine or get sued or something so <clears throat> anyway but that's a uh, the, the Quaker State oil there's nothing wrong with Quaker State oil you know, and oil is miscible. M-I-S-C-I-B-L-E means that uh, oil is, is kept to the same standard, you know, just because you're somewhere and maybe you've got, uh, you had put motorcraft in your engine while you had the oil changed and you suddenly find yourself needing some oil and you're on a trip, but they don't have motorcraft. You can still buy any other brand of oil that's a reputable brand and you can pour it in there and it's not going to cause a problem. You know, some people are really, 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 really particular about the kind of oil they use. Um, but, and you know, and I like to use the Motorcraft Synthetic Blend on my pickup truck because that's what it calls for. And it takes seven quarts of oil to fill that 4.2 liter up. But my Explorer, you know, I may use the uh, the Quakers, I mean the Motorcraft or whatever in that one, you know, as long as it's not some dreadfully cheapy brand of oil or something like that. Uh, all filters are not all created equal either. You got to be careful about your oil filter. They all look alike, uh, but they're slightly different on the inside. Some people have actually cut oil filters open of different brands so you can see the difference in how they were made on the inside. But, you know, it's just always a good idea to use a good brand of oil filter one way or another. Anyway, this right here was a problem that happened on an expedition. What we did was we raised it up on the lift for some other reason. I don't remember why it was on the lift, but we raised it on the lift and that shock absorber was stretched out farther than it ever had been for many, many years. And as soon as we stretched that shock absorber out, you know, by raising it up, it started leaking oil really, really bad. And so I showed it to the guy. He, had, he was a retired deputy sheriff and he was really uh, annoyed by that, but all we did was raise it up on the lift and he said, well, let's put a shock on it. You know, we had to we had to take that down and put a shock absorber on that one because that would leak it so bad. Good idea to put two of them on there, but this guy right here was kind of tight with his money because he was retired and living on a fixed income, and he didn't have the money to replace both sides, so we just put the side on. He told us to put, locked it all down and everything. You can make a good case for changing both of the shocks, you know, shocks in pairs or sets or something like that. <clears throat> but in a situation like this, if the guy doesn't have the money to change but one, then you change the one that he's got the money to pay for. This right here was uh, an interesting thing. One time whenever I was still teaching at the college, we were on spring break, I got a call from uh, Action Magazine editor up there, the guy that was my, he was the guy I worked with whenever I was writing articles for Action Magazine. And he said, I need you to go to this equipment company over in uh, the local town, you know, about 30, 40 miles away and see if you can find some kind of a job that they're doing over there that has to do with air conditioning and write me an article for this job. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. I said, I'll, uh, 
I'll see about that. And so I went over there, and when I, when I went into the place, it was an equipment company, and I says, I need to write a magazine article about something to do with air conditioning. And he said, well, they're putting a set of track pins on out here. And I said, no, I don't want anything like that. He said, well, this guy out at the steel yard is putting an uh, air conditioning unit on a, uh, I mean, air conditioning compressor on, on his knuckle boom. I said, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And I was dressed in my uniform, and I says, uh, I need to go out here and uh, see if I can work with this guy and take some pictures and maybe write a magazine article about it. I got his permission to do it. <clears throat> so I wrote a magazine article saying, a day in the life of dot, 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 you know. And it was more about the guy that was doing the work than it was the work he was doing, although they wanted it to be some kind of air conditioner work. But one of the things I thought was interesting in the way that this thing was designed was it had this box that had the compressor in it, a motor pulling it, and somebody had put this uh, fan right here on it that they got off of a car out there, and it had two condensers side by side. It was set up kind of like a central unit, but it was basically an automotive style air conditioner compressor, and we put a compressor on it and all that. <clears throat> but the guy had his service truck backed up out there. We were standing in these mountains of scrap metal out here of all kinds of stuff that you could, everything you could possibly imagine, including an old 53 GMC pickup somebody had left out there, and they would shred that steel and make it into basically just powdered metal, and then they would haul it out of there and uh, go take it to a foundry somewhere, whatever, as a recycle thing. <coughs> well, what the deal was, he says, I'm going to have to have a 3 8 nut for whatever reason it was, and he says, let me go down there and get one out of the truck. So he got off of the knuckle boom, went and looked in the side of his truck, and he was cussing this guy that was from the at the shop and said that guy took this can of nuts out of here. He had this the can of mixed nuts in there, I guess. He says, and I don't have any nuts here at all. Here we were standing in between these big mountains of scrap iron that you might have noticed out there. I said, wait a minute, don't you think we could go to one of these to somewhere out here and find a three eighths coarse threaded nut? And there was a lawnmower with a shell of an old push mower over there. And we went and took a nut off of one of the wheel axle things and, you know, that's where he got that nut. I mean, there's plenty of nuts all around us. And it's like, you know, he, he was so focused on finding that can of nuts in his truck that he didn't even think about the fact that he was surrounded by a source of just about any kind of fastener you want and all that junk that was piled out there. Uh, this right here you may have run into whenever the desiccant bag comes apart in the dryer and you wind up with issues with your pressures and you can look at this the little uh, stuff down in here, you know. And it's not rocket science to figure out where those little desiccant balls came from, you know. And I don't remember what kind of vehicle that was, but that's when that we had to clear all that nonsense out of there and replace that. And that was fairly common back in the day. Now, it's not quite as common if you have a receiver dryer as it is if you've got an accumulator, because an accumulator's got a desiccant bag, and if that bag comes apart, you know, you'll wind up with a lot of that desiccant going. It can even destroy the compressor at some points. I want you to watch these here. See these gauges? What the readings are on them? We got really high, low side, and we got high side pressure. That's sort of, you know, it's just not working very well. And I got in there and I measured the temperature of it. It was like 86 degrees coming out of the register. And what we wound up with here uh, was, and it wasn't too hard to troubleshoot, well, we wound up with a bad scroll compressor. These scroll compressors just love to die this way, and you can pull them apart, and they make some really interesting little patterns in there to <laughs> look at with all that scratched up stuff. Uh, these scroll, scroll compressors can cause a pretty big, uh, you know, cost a pretty good bit of money depending on where you buy them. Um, if you've got a shop, you can build an account with Ranshu, R-A-N-S-H-U, or uh, I don't know how you spell that, but anyway, I used to have an account with them. And uh, they, everything they got is like, it's got a pink motif to it, and they they've got warehouses all over the place, and they they've got really good prices on air conditioning parts, and all that. And if you, but you can only do it if you're a shop. You can't buy Ranchu, uh, you I mean, uh, air conditioner parts unless you have unless you're running a shop, and they and you, they basically can verify that you're a shop owner. I was a school, so I was able to do that. But anyway, I did that. Um, one time, this uh, welding instructor had a 
problem with his air conditioner or whatever Chrysler it was he was driving and it was one of those kind of wherever you change the shims to change the air gap on the compressor clutch. And so I got under there and I told this student, I said, take that bolt out, pull that off, let's change that shim out. And the student was just a sort of a duh head and he wouldn't even do anything. So I got in there, took it off, pulled it out, took a shim off, put it back in, measured the clearance, got his air conditioner working again. And the welding instructor was so happy, he gave the student a $20 bill. Well, the student didn't do a dad gun thing, you know, whatever. Anyway, I didn't want a $20 bill from the guy. I couldn't take it anyway, but the student took it uh, like he had been the one that done the work, you know. Anyway, not a big deal uh, on that. These right here, that circuit breaker right there, uh, is an interesting little thing. You know, a lot of these components, they'll put a circuit breaker in there in case it gets overloaded, and that breaker is a resettable breaker that will do that when it gets hot and come back together. And headlight switches uh, for years had a circuit breaker in them like that. And the reason they put a circuit breaker in a lot of these headlight switches, a lot of them have got fuses now, but they'll put multiple fuses. They'll put a fuse for each dim light and a fuse for each bright light. So you have four fuses a lot of the time. Well, back in the day, they put a circuit breaker in there because even if that circuit breaker failed or if there was some kind of a short, it would still keep resetting. And so you would basically have lights and it wouldn't be like you were driving in the dark and about to run into something. It's kind of a safety thing. <clears throat> but uh, we would see uh, vehicles come in and the headlights would be blinking off and on, you know. And, uh, and up to a fairly late model, you can still find those vehicles. If you look it up in the schematic, it'll show you a drawing, schematic drawing of the headlight switch and it'll have a little curved bow-shaped circuit breaker built into it. But a lot of these power window motors and stuff like that have got those in there too. Now, now every now and then you'll run into a situation where you'll find a bolt that's loose like that and if somebody either left it loose or didn't tighten it enough so it stayed tight and it starts working its way back out. And it's really a test of integrity whenever we find ourselves in a position where something's just a lot of trouble and we feel like, well, I don't really need to put this bolt in anyway because it's too much trouble to get to and there's four bolts and three of them will hold it and all that, so I'll just <coughs> put that one in. I had one student that uh, we, you know, we would have this Toyota Corolla that we'd always pull the manual transmission out and put it back in. And by the time this one student got to that thing with so many people over the years and pulled the transmission out and put it back in, there was only one bolt holding that transmission in because people would just pop it back in there, put one bolt in it, and claim they were done with it, you know, because they knew it was a trainer car and it wasn't ever going to be driven on the highway. <clears throat> but that guy was such a fastidious character that he drilled out every broken bolt, he fixed the threads in every hole, and when he put that thing back in, he put every last bolt back in there and tightened them all to spec. That's the kind of work all of us ought to be doing. Uh, you know, of course, the way that we used to get paid when I was working at Ford is they would, uh, if we had some stuff to do like drilling out or fixing threads or something like that, we would get paid extra time for that rather than having it apart. We just have to notify the service manager or the service rider that it was going to be an extra charge for, you know, the extra work we were having to do that wasn't part of book procedure. Um, anyway, this right here was my coffee table. Uh, I had a uh, <clears throat> I had a coffee table. Sometimes I'd have two coffee pots full of coffee there and instructors from other departments and students and all that. I never did put one of those jars there for people to put money in to help pay for the coffee because I felt like coffee didn't cost all that much and I would just provide a free service and I kept creamer. Now one time I did stop putting sugar out there because some of these nut heads, if I put a five pound bag of sugar out there, you'd see them pick up the whole thing of sugar and they would literally pour so much sugar in their coffee that half of the cup of coffee would be sugar and when they got through drinking it it would be a bunch of sugar in the bottom of the cup and so uh, it didn't take me very but a couple of times of seeing that to where when we ran out of sugar we stayed running out of sugar for a while <coughs> but I would keep me some you know low calorie sweetener or something to put in there long and short of it is uh, this was a coffee shop that everybody on that campus knew they were welcome to come and get a free cup of coffee. Uh, I didn't always have cups for them. They had to bring their own cup. And so, uh, you know, you just we can all have an attitude that will make the place we are a better place. You can have a rotten attitude and you can make that whole place stink. 
you know, you can act ugly if somebody comes in there wanting a cup of coffee or whenever they come in, you can say, sure, come back whenever you want. If I don't have any made, I'll even make you some, you know. And so I basically was just trying to be, you know, the good guy so that everybody would, you know, for about three years after I went to work at that college, I felt like I was out of place because I'd been doing mechanic work for 25 years. And I felt kind of like the low man on the totem pole for it took me about three years to get used to the notion that's where I was supposed to be every day because it didn't feel the same as it did going there, you know, punching in, drawing a ticket, fixing a car when all I had to be responsible for was me. And uh, they took the instructors, the other ones, you know, a while to warm up to me too, but that's okay. You know, sometimes that's the way, that way when you go to a different job. <clears throat> this was a shop over here close to where I live. And I thought that was so cool that I took a picture of it. These people have been collecting nameplates off of old cars for a very long time, and they had just about, you know, uh, wallpapered the uh, that end of the shop over the main office with all of those different things. I don't know how long it took them to do that. And I didn't ask them, but boy, that was just a cool look. I don't know if it's still there. The shop's got a different owners now, but that was just a, a cool little wall of theme. I thought every thing you can think of as far as all the different uh, logos are on there, you know, they're going way back years before. We refurbished a refrigerator in the shop by painting it red. It was a dirty brown color and it was kind of rusty and I had the students to sand it off and mask up the handles and all. And whenever they got through, I had a craftsman decal that came off of a toolbox and it was a fairly new toolbox, but you know how those things come off the toolbox. And I got some of that sticky, I mean, that double-sided uh, emblem tape, and I put that craftsman thing on the refrigerator, and it really looked good in the shop. Uh, the auxiliary services director had us a sink put over there because I had girls and boys, and I didn't like them going to the same bathroom to wash their hands, you know. And so I had a sink put out there in the shop because we already had hookups for it. And they put a little sink out there that looks like something you'd have in your bathroom. And it was sort of blonde colored wood. And I said, this looks like we used to teach culinary arts and now we're teaching auto mechanics. And so I had the same people that painted this refrigerator to use that same color paint to paint that vanity. You know, they masked it off and everything. And it turned out we had a cool looking little red, you know, with a red uh, vanity. It looked like it went in the shop a little better than having one that was blonde wood colored. You know. These are these Whitworth sockets. These things are pretty much useless for anything except working on old motorcycles or fabricating tools. You know, you can use them to beat on or something. But whenever you bought a set of Craftsman tools, uh, if you bought the big set, like the 475 piece set or whatever, not only did they put Whitworth sockets in there, they would put those 8 point sockets that are good for working on tractors and plows and stuff. But they ain't worth a flip for working on a doggone uh, any kind of a car because no car has a square nut like that. Unless back in the old days somebody lost the wing nut and they put a square nut on the breather. That was always aggravating because when you tried to grab it and screw it off there, you had to use a pair of pliers to break it loose a lot of the time. Anyway, those Whitworth sockets, I would always separate them because I don't like them rolling around in there somewhere and you think you're picking up a 5 8 or 11 16 or whatever and you pick up one of these kind that, you know, you can't use 17, 30 seconds, 25, 30 seconds, be real. Uh, but Craftsman pretty well did that. This Pro Cut brake lathe, uh, on car brake lathe, I had used two or three other ones. This one here was the easiest brake lathe to set up and use that I had ever seen. When I set up that new automotive program at that other town, <clears throat> you know, as a part of the job I was doing for the college, I got this $10,000 brake lathe from ProCut, and that thing right there, you know how in the initially you'd have to use a dial indicator and all this stuff to set them up. Then they got to where you could basically on the on the hunter, you basically would uh, make adjustments to the little uh, eccentric until you got your green lights in the middle. On this one here, all you had to do was flip a switch and tell it to calibrate, and it would automatically set itself where, it, where the run out was set. That was handy as a shirt pocket. It was quick. It did a beautiful job. And uh, probably one of the best ones of those I've ever seen. Of course, the newer, the farther along they go, these people that design these tools will make them better as they go and where they make them easier to use. Now, I saw a thing on LinkedIn this morning about these. And y'all, you guys, some of you may work at a shop where they have them. 
these tire machines that take the tire off and put it back on for you without you having to do hardly anything. And you know, you just basically, if you wanted to break it down and take it off, you just walk away or fold your arms and watch it happen. And I was thinking, well, that's okay, but it seems like every time you turn around, they're dumbing us down a little bit so that if this thing, if, if that's all you're using for a couple of years and then all of a sudden that thing breaks down and somebody's got to do it the old-fashioned way and they hadn't been doing it the old-fashioned way because it's easier to let the machine do it for you, they're going to be out of their element and won't know how to do the work. I don't know. That's just me carrying on as an old-timer, I guess. I had people when I was a young boy uh, that was always complaining about the stuff that was changing. And, you know, when I, in the 70s, whenever I was in my 20s, they would say, you know, what is this electronic ignition stuff? You know, why didn't they just leave the points alone? And I said, well, we could still be riding horses, you know, but things change. That's just the way it is. I'm not personally a fan of the electric vehicles or the hybrids myself, but they're not going anywhere. So you just may as well get some training and get prepared to work on those things. This right here is caused by valve stem seals leaking, these puffy hard deposits. They can also cause the vehicle to surge. It may even surge and when you disable the EGR it will stop surging and you may find this on there. And so if you see that, that doesn't mean you need to stop everything and throw a set of valve stem seals on it. But what it does mean is they're leaking. Chevrolets, uh, small block V8s were terrible to have a, have a problem with these valve stem seals leaking. And, uh, but that's just, you know, a little thing. I took a picture of a plug we pulled out that had just had these deposits on it. Well, until next time, I hope I had not bored you to tears with this video. Uh, but I just wanted to sort of get some stuff off my mind whenever I looked at some of these pictures and sort of expanded what I was thinking about. But I really appreciate you guys listening, and I hope you'll come back next time.